I interviewed a longtime underground market psychedelic purveyor who's been doing it for years and years and years. And they told me that 20 years ago, they never met the chemists who were producing and synthesizing the various products that they were selling, the DMT or the MDMA or whatever it be. And that now there's chemists all over. And I think that's something that the establishment is having a very hard time contending with right now. So I've actually commented several times and been pretty on the money, like almost immediately on the money with this. But I mentioned like, hey, this is what's happening and this is gonna be a possible response to it. And one of those, one of those comments was about the, the media narrative is going to, to evolve to a point where they're gonna start, whoever is deploying these headlines are gonna start essentially pumping disinformation and misinformation about mushrooms into the headlines. And literally a week later, there was a quote, pilot who tried to hijack a plane under the influence of mushrooms, yeah. which a lot of people quickly were able to point out there's there's a lot of unanswered questions around this scenario. And then that was perfectly timed with the vote of a decriminalization bill in California that ultimately was rejected. And that's one of the circumstances that Newsom cited was that, well, there's this high profile incident of someone trying to bring down a, a plane that has black ops written all over it, right? You have something that everybody's enjoying. It's got a lot of press. It's got a lot of near ubiquitous universal praise. Like David Nutt put out a study saying that mushrooms were the least harmful of any substance. And now all of a sudden you have a bunch of people growing them, a bunch of people sharing them. Well, anybody who wants a more hierarchically controlled system or future is not at liberty to allow a bunch of, you know, have nots and know nothings running around sharing very powerful psychoactive substances. So what's the logical conclusion? You pump the supply full of suboptimal or dangerous products. You amplify adverse events in the media. And that has happened several times, including this week when a new article just came out in SF Gate, which is a pretty well-known San Francisco-based publication about research chemicals that are being marketed as psilocybin mushrooms. And of course, this happens but I would argue it's only happening to people who are buying online and buying from you know crappy smoke shops. Like nobody in these underground circles, which are quite public facing at this point, is putting four ACO DMT in their chocolate bars. Like you got to know your grower, or you got to grow it yourself. But again, if you were someone who wanted to sort of undermine this em emergent space and and peer to peer sharing of everything you would amplify a lot of these kind of disinformation headlines and that seems to be what's happening so again uh I, I don't fully buy into all my bullshit but i just call it like i see it and that seems to be where we're at right now 100 percent, 100 percent, brother and yeah i agree with it and i think yeah to go back to your other point try and go through this chronologically if my brain will let me um I think diplomacy, 100%. And I think, as I said, humor as a disarming tool, like, it's it, it, it's wonderful. You put anybody from any background, a good, a good like, stand-up comedian knows this. It doesn't matter the makeup of that room if you've got good material and you can work on your feet. Do you know what I mean? And it, so it, it levels people from all economic backgrounds, different classes, different races, ethnicities, and, and different entirely dogmatic belief structures, you know what I mean? Can laugh at the commonality of it, you know, from the banality of Michael McIntyre in a fucking Hoover or whatever to something that's, you know, very nuanced and and, and whatever. It's my, my point being that, yeah, it disarms. And I think that's what we need more than ever because we know on this side, they're inevitable. The, the corporate takeover and capture and eventually the, as we're currently seeing, like six grand uh, for ketamine infusions here in the UK. You know, they're looking to get the DMT up and running and it's going to be similar sort of pricing. And again, it's like, well, I can get a gram of that for a hundred quid. <laughs> do, do, do you know what I mean? And I can get a cart of it now from quite trusted sources. As you said, the, all, we're in this kind of, these two parallel worlds where the actions of one increase the other. So the more they try and go off and they have a positive story in the telegraph or whatever, like a big paper over here, uh, they're saying that, you know, the future of healthcare is X, Y, Z, you know, psilocybin mushrooms, or it's not, it's always psilocin because that's where the patents are in the, the companies. They don't want us growing psilocybin containing mushrooms. They want to go, no, no, no. The thing that you, change it to in your body or you can get through lemon tech uh google lemon tech if you don't know lemon tech folk and have some fun with your mushrooms um 
that is is where they've gone with it. It's the same with cannabis. That's why we ended up where we are with cannabinoids and all of these, oh, THC, A flower, and all of this shit legal under the hemp act. You're like, that's cannabis. And like, oh, well, this this is hemp. Th- that's cannabis. And you're like, well, this that that's cannabis. Like this, well, that's not even weed. I don't know what that is. Keep that away from us. You know what I mean? It's like so there's these separate things that are created as a consequence of their restrictions, but they restrict us because they want to make the money, but they don't understand the true popularity. Like, uh, there will always be a hardcore, you know, what do they call them, straight-edge individuals that are like, nah, never going to touch it, never no, don't want anything to do with it. But they would then still get the help through medicinal access. They could then go to a psychiatrist and do whatever, and it'd be in that controlled space, and they would never, you know, sit with a pipe of changa under some trees around a fire with their friends and just, just sit and just be in that space together. Do you know what I mean? They wouldn't, like me and my mate did for a year every Sunday. We took acid every Sunday. And we used to do this first time I talked about this on the fucking record is we would put my my couch to bed. So I had two couches at the time. And for fucking every Sunday, we just got the thing. We wanted the space on the floor because we did end up doing fucking stretching and fucking exercising. We had a big, giant, fucking trippy uh, knitted blanket that his blind granite made us. And uh, so that like went on the floor and you just made like a psychedelic fucking space and you just trip balls. And then we just watch documentaries and we just learn shit, read books, whatever, fucking just go through this fucking space. And so, yeah. About three months into doing this, one night we both were just crying with laughter for about 15, 20 minutes because we decided to put the other couch to bed. So taking it out of the lounge, taking it into the bedroom, and putting it on the bed. And we were just so broken with joy and giggles, like every muscle was hurting. It was just that child state of wonder. Like, they're never going to prescribe me that. Do you know what I mean? Like, that they can't deal with that. But then I should be able to have that space that, as I've had other times, where I've had moments where I've had friends completely lose it on acid, and I'm too fucked on acid, and I try to catch with them, but they're in the, I don't know if you've come across it yourself, like the loop, the cognitive loop, where you've got somewhere from between 30 seconds to 90 seconds, and the brain just loops around. And he was asking the same question again, and we answered, it, and you're here, and this is what's happening, and then, oh, where, oh. And it just went on for hours and hours, and it just was a difficult space, but there was no one to talk to. We didn't have some of the services you've now seen arising in America and some of the states. You know, you can do some fucking Googling, but you're so fucked up, you can't even find the screens. You can't pick up a fucking phone, do you know what I mean? You, you, you like, so it's both sides, if we have that conference, that kind of uh, parlay, as it were, together we can figure out how to make it work. And yeah, they need to deal with some of this shit. Soldiers and PTSD and violence, and that's it, there's a tra- violent trauma survivor. If and then I was going into a setting where I could have to be reliving shit like that, you're gonna have to be aware of that. My friends aren't gonna be dealing with that. When we're tripping, we're like on a beach, fucking swimming in the ocean or some shit, or fucking, which I don't recommend for safety, uh, or camping in the woods, or do, do you know, we're, we're in that experience. So there isn't the worry of your, your other parts, I suppose, or when that comes up. You have a bond with those people that it's not embarrassing, it's not humiliating. Accidents happen. People end up in difficult situations. Do you know what I mean? Whereas there's then it's horses for courses, I guess, and is the most easy way to round off what I'm trying to say here. Yeah, I think it's extremely important that there are multiple access points. And I often try to emphasize this when I do speak publicly, that I'm not anti corporate psychedelics, but I am anti that being the single track of what's available at the expense of much broader opportunities to hopefully evolve our world. I think that that was the great promise for a lot of people who have had psychedelics is that it brings up so many new ways of relating to the world, thinking about the world. And what you have with this, what I see as a oversimplified reductionist viewpoint of turning it into another pharmaceutical tool essentially and that's the only way that you can legally access this or or participate in it it essentially creates a trauma harvesting operation right it's like you're setting up this harvest for trauma because if you're not making any structural changes in the world as difficult and as time consuming as that may be then you, you are going to have soma and this has been admitted i think by a number of people funding some of this uh, more corporate psychedelic spaces is that, yeah, it'll help people come to terms with their place in society, if you will, to the point where even, you know, with ketamine clinics is how it's starting with different employment covered ketamine therapy. Well, it's really perfect, right? You can have a position that maybe you're, you know, not thrilled about, 
but then you can go get high on your company dime and uh, detach and dissociate from your menial position in society. And then it's not so bad. And a lot of people have used alcohol in the same way, right? Where, and again, like I love to party. Like I'm not, I'm not one of these like puritanical, no, I'm Cali sober. Like I love to party, but I also recognize sometimes like ah, it's an easy way to mask your issues or whatever. And in some ways, like if, if you have this version of psychedelics, like how are any of these companies going to make money on something that they can give people twice or a handful of times? Like that cannot be the business plan. The business plan has to revolve around some kind of revolving door or recurring dosage session. Like you need to do this six times, you know, twice a year. And uh, I think a lot of these um considerations are still being uh, uh, established. People are still kind of learning. Like, you know, it's been so confusing what's happened over the last few years in some ways that like no one can wrap their head around the direction that we're headed. But I do think that there's a, a likelihood that we are headed towards a very rigidly controlled environment. And as an analogy or as a, an allegory here is like when, when a fish tank is super dirty, shouldn't you clean the fish tank instead of drugging the fish? And I think that we're taking that approach with corporate psychedelics. It's like, we don't want to clean up any of the societal inequities. We don't want to seriously examine the power structures in society. We just want to drug people. And man, if I were the ruling elite, I'd probably do the same thing. So can't knock it until you've tried it, I guess.